uh, I'm going to minister just for a little while, and then we're going to do water baptism. And uh, we've got, what, five or six people, I think, that are going to be water baptized tonight. So praise the Lord. This is our first uh, uh, one of these that we did on purpose. We had this planned before any of the uh, present things happened. And so Pastor Mick, I'm sure, is enjoying this service from a whole different building. Amen. But I, I'm going to tell you right now that uh, what I have to share with you tonight, I tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to get away from, and the, I just felt like the Lord would not let me get away from this. And so would you turn your Bibles over to, I'm going to read two scriptures, but I'm going to concentrate on Ephesians chapter 4. If you have a Bible, Ephesians chapter 4. And then uh, I may go to Psalms 133, but I'm, just, I'm definitely in Ephesians chapter 4. I want to minister tonight on the subject of unity, and this is going to be a two-sided, I hope, I think, maybe. Uh, one is going to be the parishioner side, and the other is going to be the leader side. Uh, Cindy and I have pastored people for 30 years, and I want you to know that trying to be unified in anything outside of believing in the working of the Spirit is exhausting. You will not ever have unity that way. You have to understand the, the seeds of disunity to understand how unity comes in a, in a, in a life, in a movement, in, in a church, and I'll tell you something, in the plethora of different doctrine that we're dealing with in today's church world, there has to be an absolute dependence upon the Holy Spirit when we preach truth, that God is going to begin to deal with unity from the inside out. If a preacher or a pastor or a leader is trying to create unity by friendships, spending time with people, uh, trying to always mend discord, dealing with relationships, you're going to exhaust yourself more than likely. I, I, I certainly have put extra years on my body and my mind, probably done damage to my marriage, my family, uh, all of that through the years, trying to create unity outside of trusting in, in right doctrine and the uh, absolute working of the Holy Spirit. So Ephesians chapter 4, and I just want to read verse 13. Let us all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure, uh, to, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Father, I just come before you. I ask for your help and your grace and your anointing. Let the true preacher and the true teacher come who is the Holy Spirit, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the word Paul uses, he, Paul is talking about endeavoring to keep unity. Now I want to tell you something. We are not peacekeepers as, as leaders. We are peacemakers, peace manufacturers. A peacekeeper is somebody that is always trying in their flesh to keep people from fighting with one another you know, always trying to keep peace. That's not our job. That's not, I'm not saying there's never a place for counseling. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying the weight of time in a leader's life cannot be given to trying to make everybody get along. That's not our job. Our job is to preach truth and let truth fall where it may. And if it falls into the life of a sincere heart, it will grow there and, and there will be peace. And so much of what we've gotten into in the, in the church today in trying to create unity is from the flesh. It's even fleshly motivated, trying to build a big ministry so that I'm famous or that people, I feel successful. But unity, true unity, can only be formed and done by the Holy Spirit within the life of a believer as truth is preached. That's the only way it can happen. And so Paul says something in verse... 13, he says that, that we all attain into the unity of, of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of Man. So hear this. It's not the unity of a church. 
It's not the unity of, of a, a ministry. It's the unity of the faith. And when you teach proper doctrine and proper faith, then th- that whatever you preach will create or not create unity. But this is what else he says. He says the key to unity is knowledge. Now this word for knowledge he uses here is epigonosco. It is divine, supernatural revelation. And I want to tell you something, that as a preacher or a pastor clings to truth, God will honor that man by bringing divine, supernatural uh, revelation in the life of the people he pastors. That's why Paul would pray over all of the churches and say, let there be divine understanding and revelation. Because when you're having God, listen, I want to tell you something, that the way God honors a preacher, in Psalm 133, it talks about that dew would fall. Dew would fall. Dew, it means that, that, that things would happen to everybody at night. That's when it falls. And when a preacher is preaching truth, God is working for you and in you when you go home at night. When you, when you are going home and being a dad and being a, a, a husband or a wife or when you are honoring God by preaching and teaching truth. And I want to tell you something. You've got to cling to truth. You've got to cling to truth. Because as you do that, then God goes home with your people. Now, I want to tell you the reasons why there's a lack of unity. And the Bible says this in James chapter. Paul says this in the book of James. No, I'm just joking. Yeah. But he says this. He says, why are there wars and fighting among you? He said, is it not coming from in you? Listen, I want to tell you something. When, when there is wars and there is fighting in the church, it is the fruit of what's happening in the inner hidden man in people's lives. And so if you want unity... You've got, to, you've got to get the Holy Spirit working in people's lives so that whatever's happening in them is being conquered by the Holy Spirit. It's being dealt with by the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you something. If you've ever tried to show somebody themselves, good luck. You'll never do it. What, what, what a pastor, and I, I'm preaching to two pe- I'm, groups of people. I'm preaching to you that attend. Listen, I want to tell you something. There's no difference between us. We are all the same in Christ. So I'm not trying to elevate one group above another group. But there's two groups of people. Really, we're all the same in some ways, right? Because we've all got to deal with self. If you don't deal with self, listen, the only thing different about self in a leader than somebody that's not actually in a position is they will, they will wreck it faster and deeper and darker than anybody else will. But you've got to have the Holy Spirit working. And we've got to understand that, that th- these battles that happen in the church, they're, they're not just springing up. They're, battles, they're, they, they are bring, they're brought there by the battle that is going on in me. If there's no unity in my own heart, if there's no unity in my own home, if there's no unity in my marriage, if there's no unity in my kids, I can't expect to go to church and then have unity in the body I belong to. Because I'm going to bring some kind of divisiveness wherever I go. And so when, 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 when Paul, you, you know, the Bible is not a counsel, it's not a book of psychology, not a book of counseling. It's a book of teaching truth. And letting the Holy Spirit work on that truth as somebody grabs a hold of it. Amen? So I'm going to give you four or five things as to why people struggle and where the lack of unity comes from. Number one, selfish ambition. Acts chapter 8 and verse 18. Selfish ambition. See, I want to tell you something. The world that we live in is a world that is destitute of identity. And people now are looking for a title. They're looking for a following to end, to to give them some reason to feel important. So selfish ambition in the church. My wife and I were talking about something earlier today. And I want to tell you something. If, If you're not careful, your soul will try to get you to do things 
to make you feel better about yourself that are not God. They're not God. People try to get into the ministry, try to get a position, try to get a title, try to do something to make themselves feel better about themselves. And it will bring a massive problem to not only you, but the people around you. Number two, condemnation. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 11, it says this. It says that a divisive man or woman, a, a person that is causing division, it says is a man who is self-condemned. Do you know that when you are having voices batter you on the inside of your life, that you will try to create some kind of following to make yourself feel better about yourself? Do you know, I heard a man say this, and I've thought a lot about it, and I want, you, I want you to hear this for yourself, and I want you as a child of God to bury this somewhere in your divine memory. Because it's important. He said, whenever somebody is forcing you to choose between their side and another side, they are operating in the flesh. And man, in all the years we pastored, have we not seen people that forced you to take their side or they would not be friends with you? If they're in a conflict, you either agree with me or you agree with them. But if you agree with them, you can't be friends with me. I want to tell you something, that is just simply the enemy. Number three, opposing teaching. Now, I want to tell you something, that true, the truth will create opposition. You got to, you got to know this. When you're, when, one of the ways, it's funny, that one of the ways you know you're preaching truth is opposition will appear. I want to, I've said this before. That I'm, I'm talking now just about Orville. You could go to any church in this town, and you're not going to hear nothing bad probably about that church, except this one. It's the truth. We've been called every name in the book because souls get saved here, because what ha- that young woman right there getting up, destiny, that, that kind of stuff happens here. Young men are saved. People's lives are changed. People are filled with the Holy Ghost, called to ministry. Men and women of God are being developed. I mean, we don't, we're, we're not just a Sunday morning, feel good, go home thing. We're bent on discipling and raising up men and women of God. And I want to tell you something. That's going to be opposed. Wherever there is truth being preached, there's going to be opposed. Number, number four, personal warfare. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.25 that you have to try to deal with people that oppose themselves. Whenever people have warfare in their life, and that's going on in their life, it, it spills over. It spills over. And then I want to talk about the last one. People that are afraid of deception. See, there's a lot of people, and we have to, we kind of as leaders have to own this in the day and age that we live in, is that there are people that are afraid of being deceived. They either have been in a church before that they thought was God, and then ended up or they were under a leader that did something. Or listen, we live in a we live in a world that that you're almost safer to go to a country that's a bunch of atheists that don't have any churches than America, because so many people you deal with have been under some other doctrine. They've been under some weird leader. They've been under some falsely motivated church. My daughter lives in California, and she said, "Dad, you can't believe how shallow the churches are in California." She said, man, she goes, it's so hard to find where you really feel like somebody is preaching to you. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When when we we need to, I'm preaching to myself, but I'm preaching to those of you that are either you're pastoring now or your heart is to pastor. And I want to tell you something. Whenever I, like I'm watching some of you, man, my, my mind goes back to Cindy in my early years. And I had so much more fire than I had wisdom. But I had fire. Man, it was devil, bring it on. Drop me in the belly of hell. You do, God, you take me anywhere you want. I mean, there was fire in my bones. But I want to tell you something, there wasn't a lot of wisdom. And so I'm, t- I'm telling you, in the day and age we live in, we have to understand that people come from a lot of weird, different backgrounds. They've been through a lot of things. And a lot of people are afraid to get deceived. And so they're, they're, they're checking you out and 
And listen, in some ways, they're looking for every fault because they're so afraid of deception. But here's what I want, I want to tell you. If that's you, in the, anywhere sitting here, if that's you, or if you as a leader are dealing with somebody like that, 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, We know no man after the flesh. Now, I want to tell you something. If you will pray... If you're, because listen, not, every, not everybody that's resisting you is rebellious. But if you are dealing with somebody or you're here tonight and you say, man, pastor, the, the thing, I, I'm so scared of being deceived, I find myself resisting being taught. Pray. God can tell you whether or not I'm a weirdo. God can tell you whether Victor is a weirdo. I can tell you whether Victor's a weirdo. I can tell you whether Brian's a weirdo. They are. They're, they, you got to be. I, I, you got to be to be in ministry today, right? But I want to tell you something. God can give you a dream. God can give you a scripture. God can give you peace in your heart and say, I can trust this person. I can trust this person. And I, I think this is so important. Because now, now I want to get to Ephesians 4 because I want to talk to you about what what proper doctrine does, how proper doctrine builds the body of Christ. And I want to tell Victor and Brian and Dwayne and anybody else in here that you know God has called you to leadership. I want to say this to Pastor John, anybody in here that, uh, 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 gosh, what is your name? You, Teresa, I am sorry, Teresa. I know that. It's like 56 going on 96 in here, you know, just two squirrels, you know, playing racquetball. I don't know. But I want to tell you something, that that God God can uh, deal with you and help you to preach proper doctrine and hold on to it. I mean, hold on to it like you've got your claws in it, because truth is going to be opposed Man, when you're, when you're preaching the truth of the cross and that at Calvary Jesus defeated and dealt with everything hell could ever dream up against a believer. At Calvary, your identity was healed. You're not waiting to, for it to get you. You're waiting to catch up to it. But at Calvary, everything you dealt with, I, I preached this morning, I tried to preach it, where the Bible says that all Jesus' bones were out of joint at the cross. And we don't realize that how every little thing that happened at Calvary relates to people. Because the term out of joint means it talks about when a sin has become so common to you that you can just slide in and out of it. And I'm telling you, when you get there and you're a believer, you can get hopeless and feel like there's no hope. I'll just quit. But Jesus hung on Calvary with his bones out of joint Because he could look divinely down the avenue of time and say somewhere, somehow, somebody that really is sincere is going to have a sin that is so common to them, it is like that out out of joint bone. And I want to tell you something, Calvary solved it all. Amen? So I want to talk about this. Number one, Paul says, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. Let me just say something. What the true gospel does is create submission regardless of condition. What do I mean by that? I mean that the devil will mask a leader in the disguise of pain, go through seasons, you prepare yourselves, leaders, leaders where you don't understand what you're going through. It happened to Jesus. Can you imagine Jesus Christ At Gethsemane, the Son of God, the man that they had watched heal the sick, drive out demons with a word. And at Gethsemane, he seems helpless and coming to them, trying to wake him up and say, pray for me. Pray for me. I'm telling you, leaders, enjoy the mountaintops because there's valleys coming. But to those of you that are, that are, that are, Sitting in the body. Be careful that you're not submitting to a condition. Just because they're doing well. 
just because they, they carry it, just because they, they seem bulletproof, because the same thing can harm you when that leader is going through a difficult time. And if you're submitting to a condition rather than to the Lord, I want to tell you something. I've heard stories of pastors being booted when they were in a bad time that were godly men, that were godly people. And, and I, I mean, ministries that have been ruined because... They were they, their path, their leader was in a situation, a circumstance, and they were judging him by that circumstance. Listen to me, truth, verse two, with all humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Remember who's talking. This is the apostle Paul. Now I want to tell you something. The mark of a great leader is not being able to blow your wig off. The mark of a great leader is to walk in humility, with patience and long suffering. I want to tell you something, man. You got to remember who wrote one third of the New Testament, the prisoner Paul. And a lot of people rejected him because of his condition, and said, "If that man were a man of God, he wouldn't be in per- he wouldn't be in prison." Oh, I want to tell you something. Don't think you, you 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 need to be careful with stuff like that. There is a bitter resolve in hell against a man or a woman that has given their life to this gospel. I want to tell you something that you you can underestimate until you are there. You can underestimate the power of warfare. I think sometimes you can dictate or you, uh, you can at least suppose future fruit by present warfare. That the deeper the present warfare the more abundant future fruit. Because I want to tell you something about the true gospel. Listen to me. Hear this. The captain of this ship, Jesus Christ, went down before he came up. And I want you to know that the principle of the gospel is that everybody God will ever use will go down before they go up. Multiple times. Multiple times. Multiple times you will go down before you go up. And in the down seasons, you want to give up. In the down season, all of your your directional uh, things you've you've used before, they're all out of whack. They're all out of whack. But I want you to know something. The principle of this gospel is that we go down before we go up. And if you're going to go up, you're going to go down first. And you're going to learn that it's not all about you. And you're going to learn some difficult lessons. But I want to tell you something. If you want to be like Jesus, then you'll bear with that situation. Listen to this. I want to tell you something. I want to tell you you preachers, you up and coming, the ones I know and the ones I don't know yet. I got a word for Lucas. I believe you're a preacher of the gospel. I believe God is going to use you in a mighty way. You know what I be- you know what God has said about you. Now I want to tell you something. This is this is the gospel. This is us. Listen to this. Paul says this. Paul says there is one body. There is one spirit. There is one Lord, there is one faith, there is one baptism, there is one God and Father. Just one. This, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't, if you like me or not, but I'm going to preach one gospel. Come on, I'm preaching one gospel. There is one baptism, and that baptism is when I am baptized into Christ. I disappear tonight. If you're getting water baptized, it is an outward picture of an inward work that when you go under that water, you cease to be you, and you are raised in the person of Christ. And listen, when this happens in salvation, I have unleashed the power of Almighty God into my life. And now the Holy Spirit molds me and makes me into the person of Jesus. We preach one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body. We preach one. We're a oneness church. 
That's a joke if you know what oneness is. There's a whole belief system. I know you don't care. <laughs> you just don't care. Verse 7. To each one is grace given. Listen, I want to tell you something. You need to understand this is a principle. Whatever somebody's doing in this body, whether it's in OMAC, Orville, or Republic, they're doing because grace gave them that, and grace has given them the ability to do that and keep doing that. What do I mean? I mean that you can't have it just because you want it. You, you, can't, you can't think, I could do that. I can do that. I want to tell you something. If grace didn't create it, grace isn't going to sustain it. And if grace isn't sustaining it, you're done. Because whatever God has called you to do is hard enough without grace. It's impossible, really. But there's no way. I should say hard enough with grace, but there's no way you can do it without grace. There's just no way. Because I want to tell you, this is not a one and done thing. I want, I want you to know that there's going to be long nights. I, I know, listen, I, I want to tell you, we used to have this couple that attended the church, and I'd preach about warfare, and, and they, they first got here and said, man, you know, you preach about warfare all the time, and man, we don't know anything about warfare. I said, you will. Oh, did they ever learn about warfare. I want to tell you something. Enjoy the good times, because there's some troubling times coming. I want you, if the devil don't oppose you, you got nothing for the hell to worry about. If the devil opposes you, it's because there's something that you are. Listen, I want to tell you something. Do you know why my son was wounded in Afghanistan? My son was a top gunner, a volunteer, a voluntary top gunner on convoys. They had the same life expectancy as a special forces person. Because convoys were attacked all the time in Afghanistan. My, my son was an MMA fighter, and I think it whacked his brain a little bit, and he volunteered for that position. Came around a corner in Afghanistan in the middle of a desert, and a 500-pound bomb planted underneath the ground exploded. And it took a 23-ton truck and blew it up in the air like it was a toy. And my son should not have lived. I, we, Cindy and I had two words from one person in Canada and one in the United States that said, your son is going to get wounded, but God's going to spare his life. And I believe that God spared his life because God did not want to deal with Cindy when she, got, when she finally gets to heaven. He, she, he would not have wanted to deal with her. She would have been holding on to that until the time she got to glory. But I want to tell you something that my son went over there with the best weapons in the world. The United States of America gave him the best weapons in the world. And when he was there, 10,000 men, American soldiers, could hold off hundreds of thousands of Muslims. You give those same weapons when we left to men that have no fight, and they ran them out of Afghanistan and stole those same weapons. What am I saying? I'm saying this. It's not about what you have. It's about who you are. If there's no fight in the gut, if there's nothing in you that will stand up in the, in the, in the difficult times, what's going to be tested is not what you can do. It's who you are. That's what's going to be tested. What's deep down in you. I want to tell you something. I just want to say this. That woman sitting right there, my wife, you have no idea how strong she is. She's been through more than you could ever imagine. I want to tell you something, that if you're really building the kingdom, there's going to be resistance. Resistance, folks. But listen to me. It, sa it says this in verse 9. Uh, I'm sorry, let's go down to uh, verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and pastors and teachers. You know where Je Victor was telling me, you know where Jesus got that from? You know what the Bible says Jesus had to do to come back with those fivefold calling? Go to hell. He had to take him out of the hand of the devil. Now I want to tell you something. God forbid that there be anybody, if, if I die, if I die, 
May nobody ever hold the title in this ministry that won't give their life for it. When you think of Jesus having to take it out of the hands of the the clasp of hell, this is not a battle about identity. It's not, a, it's not a battle about whether or not I feel good or my church is the best or how I compare. This is a battle about holding on and walking in something that Jesus had to go to hell and tear it out of the hands of darkness to give it to you. It shows you the power of the call of God, the potential of the call of God. I've said this multiple times, but a lady that is Facebook friends with me she, attends fam- she attended Family Worship Center. She just moved, Brother Swigert's church. And th- they were at a prayer meeting, and she took a picture of Brother Swigert. He was sitting off. They had it the, in the Bible college then, and they t- he t- she took a picture of him sitting in this chair at 89 years old at a prayer meeting. She wrote underneath it, she said, the prayers of this man have changed millions of people around the world. And I thought... I want that to be me. You see, I'm telling you, what happens in your inner life, what happens, what happens in your inner life, what happens when nobody's watching and nobody knows, I love, the, I love the verse where, what is it, Psalms 2, where the Lord says, ask and I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance. I want to tell you something, I've never asked for money, I've never asked God for money. I've never even asked God for big buildings. I've never even asked God for a big ministry. I've asked God for souls. And when that young lady got up here tonight, Destiny did, and she began to say, and I know a little bit about her life, and she began to say where she's been and what Jesus has taken her out of. And and I watched Veronica, her friend here, wipe tears from her eyes because she knows. When you talk about Brandon getting up and saying two years ago, I remember when he walked into the very first AA, and you could see you could see on his face what he was. I re, listen. I want to tell you something. That that bongo player used to be a drug addict, a drug salesman. Pastor Brian used to make meth. Went went to prison for making meth. And I'm going to tell you something. You see what God, what the Lord has done? Come on. Look what, John, look what the Lord has done. When I get to heaven, Jim Rounds that started this church that when he was in his early 60s, sold his house and built that other building, started this church. He would never have imagined, I don't, I don't know, maybe he would have, but I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe in his private life he knew. But I'm going to tell you something, I, I, it's beautiful. I knew Patrick, by the way, I knew you a long time ago. And I knew the man that was unbroken. And I know the man that God is breaking now and, and rebuilding him. Amen. So, uh, I just want to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close here in just a second. But it says this, it says that he gave some apostles and prophets and some pastors, evangelists and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So I want to tell you, you know, you and I as leaders, we are to equip others. You know what a good leader is doing? They're working themselves out of a job. They're raising up people that can do what they do and hopefully do it better than they do it. That's what biblical leadership does. But the, but the idea here is this. The idea is that God, through your leadership, is giving you a sword and giving you a shield and giving you armor, and he's preparing you to know how to use them, and hopefully that's what's happening in this house. I want to tell you something. We are not raising Christianettes weaned on sermonettes. We are raising men and women of God that are warriors in Jesus Christ, that have lost all fear of self and have lost all fear of the future and have lost all fear of going forward and with abandon have said, give me the call of God. Give me the destiny of God. Tell me where to go. Point the direction and get me going. Hallelujah. Amen.
I want you to know that MFI just sent all of us pastors out this email. He said there's a little church in Rathdrum, Idaho. Their pastor just left. There's eight or ten families, 12 families there. And I want you to know, the 26-year-old in me went, ooh, a town of about 10,000. I'm serious. Now, listen, I battle like you battle. I wore, I, I wore like you wore. But I, I, I'm surprised sometimes that, that in my darkness and, and, and some of my dark moments how that thing will just spring back up in me and say, give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. I want to tell you something. That hopefully until Jesus takes me home, I will be that example. Now turn your Bibles, if you would, to Psalms 133. And I'm going to finish, I promise you. It's only three verses. How long can it go, right? Yeah, I know, right? Be quiet, Catherine. You're going to depress everybody. <laughs> Listen, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. I want to stop right there. You see, I believe that Aaron is a type of Christ. And as we preach Christ, the oil will flow. It will flow down people's heads. It will flow down ours. And it will flow down the people that we are faithful to. As we preach truth, as we are not moved away and preach truth, fables and preach to excite people's soulish issues, but we preach truth. Now listen, oil, I want to just talk about oil, three things. Number one, and you all know this, Psalms 23, 5, that the shepherd applied oil to sheep who had bugs in their head, and they would have these little mites that would be burrowing into their skull, and it would echo in their ears, and they would be being driven nuts by what was going on in their head. And I want, to know, I want you to know something, that if we will be faithful to truth, that the oil will flow. And listen, the oil doesn't mean I'm going to counsel until 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm done with that noise. My faith is that if I preach this gospel, that when you leave, the oil is going to flow over your mind. It's going to flow when you're sleeping. It's going to flow when you get up in the morning. It's going to flow and all of the voices are going to be conquered and all of the little things that are bothering you. There's going to, and I'm, going to tell, I'm waiting for the phone call to say, Pastor, I walked, out with, I walked in with some mites in my head, but I walked out with freedom in my mind. Come on. Come on. I want to tell you something. Pastor Victor, Pastor Brian, the advice I can give you, don't worry about troubled saints. You preach this gospel. And I'll tell you, God will take care of troubled saints. Teresa, same with you. Amen. Amen. Anyway, number two. Psalm 141.5. Are you ready? Psalm 141.5 says this. Let me get to it. There we go. Okay. It says, let the righteous smite me. In kindness and reprove me, it will be oil upon my head. Do not let my head refuse it. I want you to know something, that oil is, be, is symbolic of being able to be disciplined. So if, listen, I want to tell you something. Sometimes the only way you get healing in your head is to talk to somebody or, or between you and the Lord or somebody. But this is really speaking of let a man of God or a woman of God, reprove me. Listen, I want to tell you something. You learn a lot about how, how desperate somebody is when they finally want to come and talk to somebody and say, reprove me. The Bible says it will not break you, but it will give you healing in your head. When you're that desperate to have healing in your head, I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters, every one of us are going to have some kind of reproof in our life. Thirdly, is identity. The Bible says that, that this one man sent out by the prophet Elisha, he said this, he said, you go and you find, uh, the, the name of the man slips me, Jehu. You find him, 
you break the box of oil over his head, you anoint him and you run out. And I want to tell you something, because the calling happens quickly. The call happens quick, and then after that, you have to continue to have encounters with the Lord. But here's what I want to say, is that the oil will tell people who they are. You see, and I want to tell you, when God tells you who you are, you don't need people to tell you who you are. Come on. You, you, you can be satisfied and content in knowing that God has told you who you are. Amen? Stand with me. I'm done.